Hey up and welcome to another episode of Last Cast. Today you join us at Moor Moncton Pools and it's quite interesting how we've ended up here today. The original plan was to actually fish the rivers but we've had a couple of hard frosts and a lot of rain's gone into the rivers locally um, overnight in the past couple of days so they're really badly in flood, about three metres up the river ooze and the nids well over the banks today so we've had a quick change of plan and decided to come up here so um, obviously we've only got the rods with us today and we've decided to keep things dead simple, do something more on the lines of um, sort of a a beginner's guide to waggler fishing, how you would get into fishing and keeping things dead simple. So with that looked at, all we're doing today is just fishing one rod with a waggler and hopefully run you through a session as to how to go about setting up the waggler, generally using it and especially on a commercial fishery like this, how to sort of change your peg with feeding using different baits to try and target different fish. So as I say we're going to keep things dead simple so I'll show you the rig now. All I've set up with me today and all you'll need when you do begin fishing, say if you're just starting out fishing and getting into sort of um, dead simple float fishing on commercial fisheries is a 12 or 13 foot waggler rod. This one today I've got 13 foot, um, I prefer it because it's more for the rivers uh, more than anything but 13 foot gives you that extra reach for both casting, line control and striking. Nice crisp action in the rod so really good for picking up the line. Um, and just a dead simple, quite cheap rod. You don't need to go spending a fortune on them, but this one's quite a nice rod to use. Nice, fast action, um, and nice and sort of forgiving in the tip as well for catching small fish. Reel wise, all you need is a nice small 3000 size reel. As you can see here, I've got a Daewoo TDM, which is slightly higher up in the price point, but again, just a nice, simple, lightweight 3000 size reel with a front drag, preferably for float fishing. And on this, I've just loaded it with 016 Daewoo TDR. So nice, light main line, but still nice and strong. Again, something between four and six pounds, what you really want to be looking for. No lighter, because if you do hook carp, then you need to be able to put some pressure on them. And also it gives you the scope to scale up hook size. Um, so nice, small reel there. Nice quick retrieve, but still quite nice and powerful for, cast, for catching carp. You'll notice crucially as well how far up to the spool I've loaded that line. You can see there it's essential when you wag the fishing that you have the line loaded right to the rim um, because otherwise when you're casting small floats, if it's not loaded right to the rim, it's going to impede your casting massively. So it's a really crucial tip that when you are looking to float fish. So in terms of the rig, I've actually not shotted it and I'll run through that in a second when I'm plumbing up, but we'll start from actually the bottom end of the rig. Today, I know there's a few decent sized carp in here, but we're after pretty much everything that swims. So obviously when you've got to think about this when you're on a venue like this is you're looking to compromise. If it was silverfish only, they would use very light hook lengths. But what I've started with is a size 18 Drennan carp maggot hook, barbless, but decent, decent level of strength. And it just kind of catches everything. Again, if it was really hard and crystal clear water, I might go down to a size 22 or a lighter pattern hook. But again, it's a compromise just in case we do encounter some carp, which with the temperatures being slightly warmer, I would expect. Hook length wise, I'm using O12 Drennan fluorocarbon. Um, it's a line that I've used for a long time is fluorocarbon and it's nice and stiff so I prefer that generally when I'm fishing both pull and running line tactics. Something I've got a lot of faith in. With it being O12, it's nice and strong so it breaks about two pound or so. Um, but if you tie the knots correctly, it'll break much, lot, much, um, much more than that. So nice and strong, just a 10 inch hook length. When you're fishing on the waggler, you want a compromise between, you don't want a short hook length like you would have on a pole rig like six inches. Um, because you want the bait to fall a bit more naturally, so 10 inches is about right. Anything more, then you're not going to get a dropper shot close enough to that hook length to register the bites correctly. You can see that I've got it attached loop to loop. If I was casting a lot further or more, or more regular, I'd incorporate a swivel into that. Say if I'm fishing a pellet waggler, something like that. And I do often like to incorporate a swivel when you're in and out a lot, but again, the conditions aren't ideal today, so we're not expecting hundreds of bites. So I'm not going to be in and out that much, so loop to loop's the way I've gone for that. Nice, easy way to connect your hook lengths. And then that just runs up to the main line. So towards the top end of the uh, the rig, just bring it down for a second now, is the waggler. So all I do, as you'll see in a second when I do plumb up, I've not shot the rig at all. What I've got there is a float adapter and the waggler that I'm going to use today. Um, I've set up quite a heavy waggler, it's a 5BB, because as you can see there's a bit of a wind on the water and it just allows me a bit more control and allows me to fish a bit further out. You'll see what I do is use a float adapter there so I can change the float, say if conditions get better I'll step down to something smaller like a you know, 2 AAA float or um, even a 3BB, something like that. Again, just to dictate what conditions are, I, then again I can always go heavy without breaking down the rig. What I do then is lock that either side with a number 8 stot either side and you'll see 
um, when I'm plumbing up, just how easily those will move up and down the line and allow me to change the depth. Obviously, you've got all your bulk shot, you know, your triple A's and your BB's on there, then you have to keep taking those off. And with them being non-toxic, they can damage the line a bit. So when you're plumbing up, just using stots is the way to do it. So as I say, that's all the, the rigs looked at there. Just pop this to one side again. And we'll have a quick look at bait choice. Obviously, maggots are a crucial part when you're fishing anywhere just to get a few bites. So some nice fresh red maggots in there with a couple of whites as change hook baits um, always give you a few options. That's the best bet to start with when you're just starting out float, fish, float fishing or fishing a commercial just to get a few bites. It'll catch any, everything that swims. Um, obviously, that'll teach you a lot about feeding, like introducing quantities or using little and often, and we'll run through that as the session goes on. But as you can see on my side tray, I've got more of a selection of baits just in case we want to dictate as the session goes on what we're looking to catch. So I've got some hemp seed, which is a fantastic holding bait for roach, um, bream, pretty much anything again. And because it's nice small particles, the fish won't get overfed on it. So it's really good, especially when it's cool, to have some hemp seed with you. If you're introducing larger particles, such as the pellets and corn that we've got, it can be very easy to overfeed the fish when the temperatures are cold. So hemp and maggots is always a great start and again catches everything. A bit more selective, we've got some six mil krill pellets there. These are more geared towards catching carp and skimmers and bigger fish um, and they make plenty of noise as well when they're going which is good for drawing fish, especially the carp. Um, so a good little bait to have. Again, I wouldn't use these on the hook but those will purely be for feed and again can kind of change the um, change sort of the dynamic of the peg by feeding them in say quantities or just introducing two or three to get a bit of noise and try and attract a few carp. The other bait that I've got is sweet corn. Again, dead simple, fantastic bait for catching everything, but just that little bit more selective than maggots. You can see it's nice and visual as a hook bait, um, and with coloured water like you tend to get on commercials, corn can really score well, especially for tench, skimmers, and carp as well, but also bigger roach can take it. So it's a fantastic bait, and again, we can loose feed that and use it on the hook. The only other thing I've got, which I always carry with me this time of year, is a few fluoro pinkies. Um, again, I can use a bunch of those on a on the size 18 or scale down to a size 20 and use a couple of them if fishing's really hard. I wouldn't expect it to be. They're a fantastic alternative bait to sort of complement maggots. And say if you're loose feeding maggots, a bunch of pinkies on the hook can quite often score like a bonus skimmer or something. So again, it's always worth just having a few options in terms of change hook baits. So as you can see there, all dead simple baits. I've got a few catapults with me and we'll run through sort of the distances that we're fishing with those. But all I'm going to look to do is loose feed maggots to start with, a few grains of hemp and try and build the peg. So that's everything looked at. What we'll do now is show you how to plumb up the peg and then get into the fishing and feed some bait. Right, so as I said there, we've run through the rigs and the bait and everything. And now I'm going to show you how to go about plumbing up a waggler on still water. Most important thing to consider is your plummets when you're using a waggler like this. Obviously your plummet's going to give you the reading of the bottom and when you're getting into fishing it's one of the most important things you'll ever learn is how to plumb up a peg because that teaches you what the contours of the peg are, the depth and it gives you a clue as to where the fish are going to be and where you can really feed. Also if you, if you, the more that you learn about using a plummet you'll be able to read what kind of bottom you're fishing on, whether it's silty, whether it's rocky or whether it's weedy, so you'll learn a lot using a plummet. Um, the plummets I like to use for waggler fishing are about 20 grams to 25, nice and heavy and I tend to use these more aerodynamic plummets rather than using say a silt plummet like that which is more for pole fishing. I like to use nice thin plummets which will cast very easily so I can get to the range that I want. Again, one of the other reasons why we don't shot the float before we plumb up is to not have two lots of, of weight on the line. Basically, what that means is that when you cast the rig with a plummet on, it's not going to cartwheel because th the entirety of the weight is based around the hook. So obviously, the rest of the rig will just follow that in the air and it'll cast nice and easily. Plummets are dead simple to put on the line. All you do is pass the hook through the little loop in the top and then just paste the hook into the bottom of the plummet like so. And as you can see, it's a nice and simple process. Um, and with the rig like that, you're obviously not going to tangle it. So to start off, let's have untangled this from the end of the rod, the casting of a plummet. It's a bit of a skill to learn because 99% of the time you're going to have to use an underhand cast. If you try and use an overhead cast, there's a risk of snapping the rod. And it's just generally not something that you want to be doing. Um, so what I tend to do is always stand up when I'm casting a plummet, let about the same length of line out as the, uh, the plummet to the reel, maybe a little bit less, and what that allows you to do is pull the plummet and sort of compress the rod to catapult the, um, the plummet out. So I'll quickly show you how to do that now. Use a finger on the spool and hold the plummet in your left hand, say if you're casting right-handed. It's a simple process of putting a bend in the rod and flicking the plummet out, just like so. And then just feathering the cast down 
and then you can see the plumage will go in like so. Again, you want to be looking at a far, mark, far bank marker when you're plumbing up and decide where you want to fish in the peg. I know there's an area that I want to fish, there's a nice far bank marker which is a tree that I'm going to fish to today, so I'm actually going to try and put the plummet in line with that. Again, it just comes down to practice how to cast a plummet, but once you learn it, it's dead simple. And as you can see there, I'm able to cast that well out into the lake, probably some 25, 30 yards, maybe a bit more if I really punched it. But I'm not looking to fish any further than that out. So you can see where that's landed now, and you'll see how the float's actually sticking up out the water. Again, this comes down to why we use, why we don't actually stop the float prior to um, plumbing up, because then the float's got its maximum buoyancy to pull against the plummet. So as soon as I move that plummet and release the line, you can see the float will pop up immediately. And you can see now, if the float was obviously shotted, it would still, it would cock down, you wouldn't be able to tell just how far off bottom or on bottom you are. With that, you can see the float is just sat at an angle, so the line's actually tight from the plummet to the float adapter, where the float is. And that's just telling me that the float's about three or four inches over depth, which for us today is going to be perfect. What I will do though, and it's always worth doing, is even if you think that's about right, is just try and get it plumbed up to absolute dead depth, and then you can always mark that on your rod and use that as a reference point. So all I'll do with this is take another three inches off the depth, and you'll hopefully see when this goes in that the um, the float will register down to the bristle. And the float's just not quite come up there. Same again in that instance. So I know that I've just taken that down by probably an inch or two too much. Again, when the water's clear, it's easier to see your float underneath the surface to get a, an idea of where it is. So all I'll do is add a, a few more inches to the depth again. And just repeat the process. It's exactly the same. Swing the plummet to hand, flick it out in line with your far bank marker, feather the cast and then just give it a bit of a twitch and allow the float to pop up. And you can see there that's probably set another inch and a half over depth. But you can see now the float's actually sat straighter in the water, so I know if I take another couple of inches off that, it'll be bang on depth. So for what we're doing today, I'm happy to use that as my marker. And then all I do, and this is again crucial in case you do get snapped or you need to re-rig, just pop the plummet to one side, Put, you, put the hook in either a hook keep or the first eye and just line it up with the, um, the eyes on the rod and then you'll be able to use that as your reference point for the depth. So you'll see where that top shot is. If I move that down a couple of inches, it's nearly in line with that eye there, which is one below a joint. And obviously that's what I can use then as my reference point for the depth. So all I'll do then is take a mental note of that, move these shot up, and then we'll start shotting the rig now and show you exactly what I'll come up with um, to fish the peg that we're going to start with today. All right, so as you've seen there, we've plumbed up using no shot on the line, got the depth right, marked it against the rod rings, and now I've put the shot on the line to get the float sat right. Um, quick word on the floats before I do go on to the rig, is obviously you've got to consider a couple of things when you're selecting a float for waggler fishing. Firstly, how you want to present the bait, and secondly, the conditions. When you're choosing a waggler, if you want to fish on the drop or that you think the conditions are going to be difficult, use an insert waggler. You can read the shot down the line much better against a tip like that. And also, if you're not dragging too much line on the bottom, it's perfect for it because it's much more sensitive. The other option is a straight waggler, which we might, might go on to later if we're using, say, baits like double corn and stepping up in hook size. This has got a much thicker top, as you can see, so you can drag more line on the bottom. When you're using, say, a bulk down the rig um, and dragging more line and you want to present more of a stationary bait, these are the best choice as well when conditions are harsh and you need to draw, drag more line on the bottom to counteract tow and wind. Again, that's the float I go for. But as you can see, conditions stay quite calm. There's a bit of a ripple, so I've used a slightly heavier float, but I've still gone for an insert waggler. The choice is going to be a 5BB, as you can see, nice, nice thin top, but still quite visible. Again, when you're using decent sized baits and fishing for decent sized fish, um, that's what you want to go for. In terms of the rig then, you can see I've just locked that on there with the bulk shot. 
when you're using the waggler obviously it'll have the capacity written on it and once you get quite like put about 90 to 95 percent of the capacity of the waggler onto the line i like to use as few shots as possible in terms of triple a's and bb's and i like to use plenty of small trimming shot that just keeps the rig more streamlined makes casting a lot easier because obviously with less um, large shot there's less resistance through the air so you can cast much better so you can see there i've still got the number eight stots that i've used to um to mark the depth and i've put the bulk of the shot there two triple a's and a bb as it's a five bb float beneath that i've got a couple of those number eight stots and then you can see a string there of five number nines those will become more apparent as the day goes on because that allows me to bring those shot down into play to change the shotting pattern You'll see it also creates a nice little boom and that just stops the line wrapping around the float on the cast so again saving tangles. To start with though down the line all I've gone for is three number nine shots spaced equally at about 10 inch intervals above that hook length so one above the hook length not which I always do as I explain with the shorter hook length then one about 10 inches above that again what you want to do is make sure the hook when you double that over can't quite reach that shot and that's going to avoid a lot of tangles and then the same again with that other number nine above it there the uh, the dropper shot that you use it comes down to the si two things how you want to present the bait and also the size of the hook bait that you're looking to present there's no point using tiny little number 10 shot if you're using double corn as it won't register and the, the bait will basically be heavier than the dropper shot if you're using double corn use like number eights as your droppers for little baits like maggots and pinkies number nines or tens are the way to go and obviously that also dictates how fast the bait falls through the water so again change your presentation but with those other number nines above there what i can do as the session goes on i can bring those into play move those down and create a bulk or even just bring more shot and bulk them right above the hook length if we're really getting pestered by small fish but again we'll cover that as the day goes on so that's the rig as you can see dead simple doesn't take long at all to set up and obviously plenty of um, of options in terms of changing the shotting and again tying rigs up also to avoid tangles so that's pretty much everything looked at now so we'll actually get into the session start feeding some bait and see if we can get a few bites right so we'll go for the first cast of the session what i'll do is quickly put a couple of catapults on my side tray because that's obviously what we're going to use to feed the peg and just depending on conditions it's always worth having a selection of catapults so you can change the distance and the sort of the amount that you feed as well so obviously i've decided how far i'm going to fish it's about sort of 25 30 yards i'm just going to go for the first cast on a single red maggot before i feed anything and what this does it gives me a marker then to reach with my catapult so there's always nice simple overhead cast nice and firm using a nice heavy waggle you can get well past the um the place that you're looking to feed then draw the float back into it and that straightens everything out nicely so initially i'm just going to start off loose feeding maggots Again, you can see fishing well out in open water, well away from any snags, so we don't need to use particularly heavy kit. And then it's just a case of using the catapult to get a good, good judge of where the distance is. What you don't want to be doing is changing the area that you feed. So once you've started introducing bait, then that's the area that you're looking to fish. So obviously I'm going to fish to a far bank marker, keep introducing bait and then casting into that area. What you don't want to be doing is casting somewhere, feeding in that one place, changing where you cast and then feed again. The whole principle behind this is to try and build an area of feed in the peg and hopefully get fish competing there. So there's always feathering the cast. That just makes sure all the shot lie out nicely and the rig doesn't tangle before it goes into the water. And all I'm feeding is five or six maggots to start with. Again, we're on a nice open bit of water, so I'm not sure how long it'll take to start getting bites. But by just introducing bait fairly consistently, we should draw a few fish into the area. One thing you'll see as well is I've got that float shotted nicely down to a bit of a pimple. What I might do is add another couple of number nines and trim that right down to the tiniest amount. Again, obviously that you, you dictate that by how um, how difficult the fishing is, whether there's a lot of chop on the surface, and again the size of the hook baits that you're using. Obviously, when you're fishing like this and just trying to get a few bites, it's important that you just feed little and often and progressively build the peg. You don't want to go piling in a load of bait at the start and then ruining the peg from the off. Again, on these commercial fisheries there tends to be a lot of fish so you, you can get away with feeding a lot more bait than you might think but it's all about increasing that level of competition in the peg just add a little bit of an indication there 
So as soon as you get a little bit of a, a knock, it's worth just checking the hook bait, making sure it's not sucked or anything. And that one has been just a little bit, so something's picked that up on the first cap or first or second cast of the day. Again, just be nice and positive when you're sinking the line. Again, the heavier the line that you use and the, the calmer the water, the harder you're going to have to pull that tip to make sure that you sink the line. So the way I like to do it is have a combination of drawing the float back using the reel and also flicking the rod tip up at the same time and that sinks the line almost immediately. I think with the wind picking up a little bit I might start introducing a little bit of hemp as well into the peg. Again as I said nice small food particles so you can introduce quite a lot and it does make a nice noise when it goes in. What I'm having to do as well is feed slightly to my left hand side to counteract the wind as well. So again, a couple of small pouchfuls of hemp. Then just keep up with loose feeding a few maggots. As I say, hopefully as the day goes on, we might move on to pellets and corn and try and isolate a few bigger fish. So again, just getting a rough spread of bait. You can see why I've got a couple of other catapults there, just in case I need to say, use um, a more powerful catapult to get the bait out if the wind does turn and ends up being in my face a little bit more. So it's always worth just having a couple of options. Again, these other catapults with the harder pouches are a little bit better for firing pellets out. So as I say, we'll keep introducing a bit of bait into the peg and hopefully we'll encounter one or two fish so it won't be long with any luck before we get our first proper bite. Go on. Right, and there's the first fish of the session now. Very tentative little bite, but it's only probably on the sixth or seventh cast. It's a nice little roach, this. Not a big fish, actually it's a little hybrid if anything. Nice little fish, a couple of ounces and a nice little start, as I say, the first bite of the session. Obviously when you are fishing baits like maggot and small hook baits, it's, it's not going to be long before you do get into those smaller fish at the start of the session. Um, and just by feeding, hopefully as we'll run through today, we'll be able to sort of be more selective in what we actually catch. And again, that's why it's always worth bringing a selection of hook baits and sort of learning how to adapt your peg to try and be more selective with the fish that you are catching. That's a good little start. As I say, it's nice to get a bite on a cold day. So obviously if there's a few fish of that kind of stamp in the peg, it's not going to be long before you need to look to up the feed in terms of the amount of hemp and the maggots that you're feeding. I've already just started feeding a bit more hemp, but just keeping up with six or seven maggots following the hemp. And obviously what that'll do is the maggots will fall nice and slow through the peg but the hemp creates a nice little bed of feed of which the most fish will feed quite happily. Um, it's a fantastic bait to draw fish as well because of the amount of oil in it and as I said earlier it won't overfeed them so again a fantastic option when you are fishing on commercials or any water for that matter it's always worth taking some hemp with you. It's another little indication there and another fish. As you can see, it's always good to have these nice soft rods when you are catching fish of this stamp. Lovely roach, that one. Again, just slightly bigger than the last. And as you can see, getting bites now almost straight away. What I have noticed though, again, just through a bit of, um, sort of watching of the rig, that these bites have come well after those droppers have settled. So again, a lot of the fish are still on the bottom with the temperatures being down. But again, you can see the bites aren't exactly ripping the float under. That's why it's important that you always do dot your floats right down where possible. Again, you'll see also after I've cast that I'm flicking the rod to the left hand side um, before I actually start to mend the line. And that's because the wind's obviously blowing left to right. So it's important that you do try and sink the line against the, the wind. That's actually going to help you get the line under the surface. So you can see there, the bait's spreading out quite nicely when I'm catapulting it. 
again, I'm not looking for a really tight spread of bait. And then just a few maggots, which will obviously spread themselves out a bit more. With heavier baits like corn and pellets, you can actually get the, the, um, the grouping a lot tighter when you're catapulting bait out. But again, when you're trying to build a nice big shoal of fish on somewhere where it's got quite a high stock density, then there's no real concern about spreading your bait out. Again, I'm always catapulting in line with my far bank marker, which is that tree. A little bit of an indication on the float there. So again, you can see I'm probably feeding a couple of times per cast at the moment. Two pouches of hemp and six or seven maggots each time. Seems to be another indication there. Much smaller fish this time. But you can see even with fish of that size, still getting a registration on the float using quite heavy droppers and dotting the float down really nicely. So I'm going to persevere using single maggot and then probably look to move up to double maggot or even a bunch of pinkies if I keep getting pestered by small fish or when I want to be more selective I should say. So what I like to do as well is as soon as I've cast I like to pick up my catapult and feed. Just to make sure that I'm getting some baiting before I have to hit a bite. But you'll notice it's a little skill to learn is that I'm able to hold the rod and feed at the same time. Which again it's a very useful skill to have especially when you're on the rivers but it's something you only really pick up through practice. Very similar to sort of how you'd feed with a catapult when you're pole fishing is rather than sort of pulling the pouch back you're pushing the catapult forward to extend the elastic and then just releasing it in line with your far bank marker. And again by having your side trays next to you and all the bait hand and your catapults it's very easy to pick the catapult up and feed without actually having to look at the float. Another little dip on the float there. So again there's clearly one or two fish out there having a feed so I'm quite happy to introduce a decent amount of bait. Say it was on quite a difficult mill pond or a canal you'd very rarely see me feeding as much as this. There's another fish on now. So again, lovely little roach this one. Clearly wants that maggot, so that's obviously an indication that the fish, is, fish are feeding more aggressively when they're taking the bait further down. So it's just a case of nicking the disgorger, or using the disgorger to nick that, that hook out. And as you can see, just popping the fish back. But it's a useful little thing to pick up is that when the fish are taking the bait down a little bit more than that it shows they're getting more confident taking the bait which is one of two things either you're generally just building their confidence through feeding or it actually tells you that there's more fish in the peg and they're starting to feed more aggressively because of that again little things like that you pick up that just give you a bit more of an idea of what's going on in the peg as the session's going on You can see it's nice to start off with a few small fish like that and just kind of build the peg from there. As I say, hopefully as we introduce more bait and a few different kind of hook bait samples, then hopefully we might start to encounter a few skimmers, maybe the odd tension if we're lucky, a couple of carp. But again, we're only about five or ten minutes into the session now and already we've had five or six fish. Just had a... There's a better fish. Right, we're into better fish now on the uh, the waggler. Feels like a skimmer this. I can feel it nodding its head. And interesting, what I've done there is I fed the peg quite heavily initially from the start, kept trickling in plenty of bait. And I've just gone on to double maggot, added another couple of inches to the depth, which I'm not sure if this is a better roach. And introduced a few bits of corn and, and pellets. Yeah, it's actually a nice roach this. And just after cutting down the feed again and just going back to feeding maggots, I've had a bite quite quickly and hooked a better fish. You can see actually this is an eyed, this one. Again, still caught on the bottom, but that's a nice fish that. Again, hooked well down. But you can see 
much better stamp fish to catch another changed species we've had a skimmer in the interim um, and a few more roach but this has been sort of the first eye that we've had so again love the lovely fish and just by making a little change like that we've just managed to catch a slightly better stamp fish so I think what I'll do now is keep just trickling in the odd maggot again and just try and increase the amount of bites that I'm actually getting because we did have a quiet spell there about 10 minutes without a proper bite to strike at and I think again when you've fed quite a bit of bait and effectively given the, um, the fish a lot of choice in terms of what they can pick up without taking your hook bait that's when you start to reduce the number of bites so quite often then by just cutting out the feed you'll notice that you'll start getting a few more bites or I should say reducing the feed but if we carry on catching silverfish it won't be long before we look to sort of bulk some more shot down add a bit more depth on and probably start fishing sweet corn on the hook just to try and get a few bigger fish possibly carp and bream But again that's a nice little change from what we have been catching so far so as I was saying all I've done now is I've cut out the hemp and I'm just feeding about six maggots might just feed a couple more this side of the float be a bit more accurate then it's just a case of leaving that now till we get a bite Again, just something that you do need to think about when you are waggler fishing is because you're creating quite a large area of feed quite often if the fish aren't feeding really aggressively they're not going to go rooting through it all and eventually find your hook bait what you need to do is just let them progressively reduce the amount of feed in the peg and what that'll do is obviously increase the chance of them picking up your hook bait right so we're getting towards the last end of these few hours that we're having on the waggler here at um, Momonton Pools and we're just getting a few more bites now that the session's moving on but as I say we're not looking to fish for too long today purely because we're just trying to keep things simple and give you a nice little introduction into waggler fishing um, we thought obviously while the rivers were up that we might as well pop down here try and get a few bites and just try and cover something really basic and as I say just have a nice enjoyable session setting up one rod and just trying to get a few bites as I say unfortunately we've not really encountered any of the bonus fish today we've had a go for them uh, but they just haven't really turned up for us again with a lot of the rain going in the uh, the colder temperatures of the past few days and also with the colour in the water I think that's really knocked the carp fishing on its head so we, you never know there might be a chance to catch a few later on today but again we just wanted to cover something nice and basic and show you how just to how to go about like waggler fishing and just how to get a few bites really just have another cast because that's just moved a bit for, too far to the right So like I've said, what we're going to try and do is just try and catch a couple more fish to pretty much round off the session. Again, obviously the main things that we've sort of covered today is just how to set up a rig and how to go about actually fishing the waggler. But also showing you how to sort of change through hook baits and change your rig accordingly to the baits that you're fishing as well. Again, unfortunately we've not caught those bonus fish that we're after. And as I said earlier today, and we've ended up basically fishing how we started except just cutting out the hemp seed and with a slightly more positive rig but by having several different um, permutations of the shotting pattern giving yourself those options you can always chop and change between it and some days you'll end up catching those bonus fish like we were going for on the corn and the pellets but other days like these today especially this time of year you might not and you just have to sort of make do with the roach and try and get the best out of the roach fishing like we have today but as I say we've been towards the back end of the session it's effectively been a bite of chuck so we've caught plenty of nice little roach the odd skimmer and as I say that solitary eye that we had earlier on still getting plenty of interest as well so I'll just try and concentrate now and see if we can catch one or two fish just to end off the session on there's another little roach Again, one of the smaller fish that we've had today that one we've had a few quite a bit bigger actually this is like a little hybrid that one again a lot of these fish that we've caught today have fallen to single or double maggot a lot in the sort of later part of the session where it seems that they've become a bit more confident in feeding we've caught them on double maggot um, the pinkies funnily enough haven't really worked today i think a lot of that's due to the fact that we've been feeding maggot and as i say fishing the same thing that you feed can often be the best way to go and it has been today so we'll see if we can just catch one more fish and probably conclude the session on that one.
again casting well past the feed you can see there's a bit more of a wind on the water as compared to what there was a little earlier on and again because we've been using a heavy waggler today we've not actually had to change the float at all to get around that again just by bringing more shot down it seems that the bites have been much more positive it's another little indication there he's just nicked one of the maggots and again i think that's made a massive difference just by bringing a couple more number nines into play and bulking the rig down a little bit more having that sort of spread bulk in the bottom half of the rig getting the bait down to where the fish are on the bottom definitely seems to have been the way to go today as you can see it's pretty much a bite to chuck surprisingly though we've not had any bites on the drop which i was quite quite amazed at really considering the fact that the sun's been out a bit of today and the temperatures have been generally up a little bit plenty of little dips on the float there where one's having a go at it so as i say i expect today to be able to catch a lot more fish up in the water probably having to move more shot under the float and just probably fishing two number nines down and maybe fishing a couple of foot deep but as it turns out that's not been the case so just having more shot on the on the rig meant I can bulk that down and fish to the bottom much more positively. And that definitely seems to have been the best way to catch these roach today. And the other thing as well, when it is cold like this, fishing to the bottom also gives you a lot more chance of catching those bonus skimmers and as I say, carp as well. Again, we've not managed to catch those today, but on another day when the temperatures are up a bit, we might well have encountered one or two. I think there's definitely been one or two in the peg as well because We've noticed for a couple of spells it's gone absolutely dead so they have been there but I don't think they've been feeding aggressively enough for us to actually catch one. But on those points when it has gone quiet I've just managed to put on a piece of corn and have a look and it's always worth doing that because it does give you that chance of catching whatever better stamp fish has moved into the peg. Let's say we had a few line bites when we were fishing the corn but nothing to strike at so again a bit of a shame but we may well revisit this on another day using a waggler probably when the weather warms up and just see what we can catch in better conditions so i say i think if we catch one more fish we'll probably use that one to end on as always hopefully there's quite a few things that we've run through today that are more sort of geared towards the beginner or novice angler um, but they'd be able to pick up and sort of learn from and employ on a commercial fishery just to try and get into fishing and again something different another tactic rather than pole fishing or fishing a method feeder just gives you a bit more scope to catch everything that swims does a waggler and it's a, a really nice enjoyable way to catch fish right and there's a nice little fish to conclude on see so feels like another roach decent stamp fish but quite a nice fish to end on one of the better roach of the day that one so we'll just pop the hook out of him another lovely little roach we'll pop him back as i said it's a shame we've not managed any bonus fish today but hopefully a couple of the things that we've run through to start off waggler fishing on commercials like this might be useful and just odd little tips and tricks regarding shotting rigs and feeding so again just a nice little way to catch a few fish especially on a difficult day like this it's good just to get a few bites so as I say, hopefully you've learnt a couple of things. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you on that next episode. So there's a better fish. Right, so we've decided to stay for another sort of half hour or so and we've just hooked a better fish now on the waggler as you can see we're starting to lose the light levels a little bit now could well be a carp this funnily enough just fishing still on that same line at about 30 yards just with double maggot the floats just had a very tentative little bite we've hooked a decent fish now all of a sudden fairly sure it's a carp but it could be a big bream because it's nodding its head if it is a carp, it shows just how lethargic they are fighting. As I say, it could be a carp, or it could be a very big bream. 
Again, just going to take it carefully, only on no 12 hook length, as I said earlier. It's just plodding around now. It's obviously a big fish, I'd suspect it's a carp. Just try very gently to get his head up. Just going to be careful as well, because obviously they, we sat on platforms today and they do tend to go for the platforms underneath you. Just like he's doing now, so just having to be really careful. Yeah, it looks like a carp, this. That's a nice little koi carp, actually. I've not had one out of, the, one out of here yet. We've only just got a little silverfish net on, so should just about be able to squeeze him in. Just shows if you wait a bit later on, it wasn't like we got the bait choice wrong, I think, earlier. I think it was just the time of day. It's fighting really hard, actually. He's just got his head up. There we go, we've got him. It's a really nice fish, this one. So hopefully once we've got him back out, hopefully be able to show you the markings on him. That's a lovely fish. See, he just hooked right in the bottom lip. Be really careful to get the hook out. This one's absolutely immaculate condition, doesn't look like he's been caught before. So if we can just show him to camera. How about that for a lovely koi carp caught on the waggler, just with double maggot on the hook. You can see gorgeous markings on his tail as well. Still plenty of energy in him, so we'll get him popped back. But that's a cracking fish to catch. Right, there's another fish now that we've just hooked close in, right at the death pretty much. I think we'll probably call this the last fish of the day for definite this time. We're really starting to lose the light now. Looks like another one of these small carp. Just an area where I've just been chucking a few micros and the odd grain of corn close in and just seen a couple of bubbles come up there. Just dropped in and straight away the float's gone. So not a monster. But still a nice fish and as you can see putting a good bend in the rod. There you go. Another nice little carp. Probably about three quarters of the size of that um, koi that we had. But you can see just hooked right in the corner of the mouth. As I say, I think we'll definitely end on this one today. Gorgeous fish, as you can see. As I say, we'll get him unhooked and pop back and conclude at that. So if it's a big one, I'll need the landing net. There we go. Right, we've just hooked another carp now, right under our feet. Just a little area where I've put in a few little micros and a couple of grains of corn, just sort of on the off chance that we might hook a fish there. Um, again, this is right at the sort of the death, the last bit of the session. Doesn't look like a big carp. As you can see, putting a nice bend in the rod, so it's always worth staying in an extra couple of hours just to see if you can nick one more. But I definitely think this will be the last fish of the day. Not a big carp, but still a nice little fish and a nice positive bite. Definitely looks like it's been sort of the time of day that's done us when we've tried to do the bulk of the video and the filming. And they've only really just started showing in the last sort of hour or two of daylight. And it's trying to get into the platform beneath me. Just caught this one on a little grain of corn, just tipped with a maggot, still on the small size 18, so just being really careful with it. So surprising how much energy they've got considering the temperature of the water. That's a nice little fish. Only a couple of pound. As I say, a nice little fish to end on. And always good to get a good bend in the rod, especially this time of year. So I'll just try and nick the hook out of him. Then we'll get him released nice and quick. Okay, I think this one's seen better days, but Still a nice little fish to catch. As you can see quite a lean one that, and a nice fish to end on. 
So I think we'll call that the last one of the day and get him popped back. 